Well, please be seated. If you'd like to, uh, yeah, if you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles, we'll look at. Um, we're going to turn to uh, Mark uh, chapter five. Mark chapter five. Well, we're actually going to read um, from the end of Mark chapter 4, verses 35, uh, through to Mark chapter 5, uh, from verse 1 through to 20. Um, I'm not, I, I've purposefully missed out the, um, the section on the wind and the, the waves where Jesus uh, calms the storm, because I, I preached that uh, just under a year ago. So maybe um, at some point as we're working through Mark, I might come back. But it does actually... Um, it does actually Uh, touch on our passage today and there are connections there so we're going to read it anyway and um, there'll be points of reference to it later so we'll read from mark chapter 4 verse 35 through to mark 5 verse 20 on the same day when evening had come uh, jesus said to them let us cross over to the other side Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he had said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obeys him? Chapter 5 Then they came to the other side of the sea, in the country of the Gadarenes, And when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was uh, that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with, with Jesus to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him, that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you 
and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Let's just pray, shall we, before we uh, begin to look at our text this morning. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would um, be with us uh, now by your Spirit, Lord, as we open your word. I ask that you would be uh, with me, Father, that you would grant liberty and unction, clarity of thought and speech, Lord, that you would penetrate our hearts today, that we would see something of the glory of Christ, that you would change us for his name's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, yeah, just a few uh, weeks ago, well, actually, it's probably uh, over a month ago now since I've last, last preached, uh, last shared with us, we were looking at the, um, the, uh, the parables uh, of the, uh, the sower, the principle of the kingdom of God uh, at work, and Jesus ushering in as the king uh, in his new in his messianic ministry, coming in and uh, pronouncing the, the, the uh, arrival of God's kingdom. And uh, we see uh, the parables that were used here. Now we, we come to uh, a section of scripture uh, just before chapter 5 where he and the disciples uh, get into the boat and they cross over the Sea of Galilee and they arrive uh, at this, um, the eastern side of Galilee. It's the east to the southeast side of Galilee in this country of the uh, Gardar- Gardarenes uh, on the east to the southeast uh, of Galilee. Um, I just want to really look at three points this morning. Firstly, uh, the reality and manifestation of evil within the lives of mankind. The reality and manifestation of evil within the lives of of mankind. Secondly, the sovereign grace and authority of Christ over all. The sovereign grace and authority of Christ over all. And then uh, thirdly, um, we're going to look at a changed life which testifies to the transforming power of God, a changed life which testifies to the transforming power of God. Firstly, the reality and manifestation of evil within the lives of mankind. We see a real, very vivid and clear picture here in our text today, chapter 5, the first 20 verses of uh, evil at work in humanity, a man who is demon-possessed Um, uh, It's a very well-known passage, this healing of the demoniac. Um, There are, in in Matthew's account, it actually says there were two two people. So we often uh, read through Mark and Luke and we hear about this uh, demoniac, but it actually uh, suggests there are two uh, individuals in Matthew. Uh, There are different commentators that uh, bring out various reasons as to why that that is, but we're perhaps not going to go into that quite now. But um, we, we know that there's this demoniac Uh, that we're looking at here in uh, Mark chapter 5. Evil spirits, uh, demons and and the devil, they've existed really since the dawn of time. We see in the Garden of Eden, we see uh, Satan coming and uh, uh, possessing a a serpent kind of creature and tempting Adam and Eve and we see the fall of humanity. We see creation coming under a curse. Um, uh, Jesus in in John chapter 8 speaks of the devil he says you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning so we see throughout the history of human uh, the human race we see this um, working of evil in various forms uh, within um, the, 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 the plan of human history we see temptation demons tempt people we see uh, temptation. The Lord himself, just a few chapters er- earlier, was, te- was um, driven off into the wilderness by the Spirit. He was tempted by the devil himself. The Lord's prayer, the Lord tells us to pray, uh, lead us out of temptation. Deliver us from, e- from the evil one in Matthew chapter 6. Deliver us from evil. So we know temptation is a very real uh, part that is played with demonic spirits. They're very real, very real beings. Uh, we also know that there's, of, there's often a, a distinction between when a demon oppresses somebody and when a demon possesses somebody. Um, that again, within Christendom, there are various uh, views as to whether a Christian, a blood-bought, born-again Christian, can be possessed by a demon, overtaken, as we see here, this individual in Mark chapter 5. But I would um, suggest to you that the scriptures don't really lean towards that. You don't really see 
anyone in the New Testament uh, epistles who, who is a, a born-again believer having demons cast out of them. Uh, but you do certainly um, see an element of, of, of oppression uh, from the enemy towards the people of God. First uh, Peter chapter 5, um, Peter writes, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, whom he may devour. And, it, and he tells us to resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood all over the world, in all the world. James chapter 4, there, Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So you see, again, you see this element of oppression uh, from demonic forces, from the devil himself, towards the people of God. And Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, the well-known um, verses concerning the armour of God. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of dark, the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... And then a little bit later on in Ephesians 6, 16, it talks about the, the taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. So we see this oppression um, towards the church. The Bible teaches that we are um, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing from the Holy One, that the, 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 the throne, the dominion of, our, of the core of our being uh, is now taken uh, by the Holy Spirit. We are, we, are, um, we are filled with the Spirit of God. And light and darkness cannot mix. There's, there's no uh, hint towards uh, Christians being fully possessed like we see here in, in chapter 5. But there's definitely scriptures that point towards oppression from the enemy. And I'm sure many of us here, if we're going to be honest, we've experienced times where we've felt oppression. As Christians, we felt that spiritual oppression sometimes in, in conversations with people or certain situations. You can almost feel that particular oppression. You know you have to go to the Lord in prayer and get into the Word and seek His face and resist the enemy uh, uh, that He would flee from us. But then we also see here what we have today, this, this picture of possession. Um, the Bible speaks about the enemy who has taken mankind captive to do his will in second timothy 2 speaks about those who have been taken captive by satan to do his will uh, our reading at the very start of our service this morning ephesians chapter 2 uh, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air that's a reference to to satan uh, the spirit uh, who now works in the sons of disobedience. We see these pictures. In Matthew 18, uh, verse 16, we see that um, when evening had come, the people brought many to Jesus who were demon-possessed. Many who were demon-possessed. Now I'll talk a little bit more about that particular verse in just a few moments. But we see the reality of possession in the scriptures we do see this from time to time you can't really take a cursory glance through you've only got to take a cursory, cursory glance through Matthew Mark Luke and John to see examples of people who are uh, possessed with demons and and the reality of Christ's healing power of his delivering power often possession in the scripture can be equated or connected with physical health the physical health of an individual in Luke 13 we see this picture of a woman who has a spirit of infirmity and she's bent over for 18 years and she's delivered by Christ on the Sabbath and immediately she's healed. She becomes, she becomes physically well. In Mark chapter 9, just a few chapters on from where we are now, we see this young boy who has a deaf and a dumb spirit and this spirit is throwing this boy into convulsions and Jesus asked his father, he says, how long has this been happening to him? And the father replied, from childhood. He often is thrown both into the fire and into the water in order to destroy him. And then Jesus, we know how he responds this kind, when the disciples come to him and say, why couldn't we cast this demon out? Jesus said, this kind only comes out through prayer 
and fasting. So we can, we can sometimes see this physical connection between demonic possession and, uh, and physical ailments. Um, but then as, um, as, as with our own passage today, sometimes there's more of a, a kind of mental or psychological aspect attached um, to uh, uh, the, the picture here of someone who's being possessed by demons. Now we need to be very careful, not, not every illness, well two things firstly, we, we just read from um, Matthew eight sixteen, where it speaks about there were many who were possessed, who were, who were brought to Christ. Now there are some, depending on your theological understanding of the end times and, and what the ministry of Christ was in that particular time, there are some who hold to the belief that there was more of a demonic um, manifestation that was taking place around the, uh, the ministry of Christ. It's almost as though the light had come into the darkness. You know, in a sense, um, if you had like a washing machine with kind of cockroaches in, in the dark and you shine a light upon that and these cockroaches just begin to flee, they begin to uh, expose, they're exposed by the light. And there's very much a picture of that as Christ comes, he's pronouncing the, advent, the uh, arrival of his kingdom, the light of God himself in the flesh coming into the darkness and we see this kind of manifestation of evil because almost as though the enemy has been rattled, his cover's been blown and we see that um, th this taking place a lot within the Gospels. We need to also be very careful because not every illness, not every health condition is always uh, related to the demonic. It's not always related to a demon um, uh, that, that, that's uh, the root cause of the issue. Um, in the, in, there's, there's two real deceptions that the enemy often has. He will either get people transfixed upon him, he will either get people constantly thinking that everything is, uh, the, every issue we have is demonic, there's a demon around every corner, and people will be constantly thinking that everything's just spiritual and demonic. And then the other tactic that he gets is that he, he convinces people that he, that he doesn't exist. So it's, there's two extremes to that, to, there's two sides to that coin. You don't want to fall off the edge either way with those positions. And especially in some more conservative reform circles today, I believe um, there's actually some, there's many people who put everything down to the physical and are actually rejecting the reality that there is a spiritual war going on, that there are, there are actually demons that do still possess people, uh, even today. So we see this man, we see this man, this demoniac. What are the symptoms? Let's just, we're still in our first point here. What are, what are the symptoms uh, of the demonic influence? Uh, within his life. Well, we see one of the symptoms is self-destruction. Self-destruction. In If we look in our text, uh, chap uh, chapter 5, verse 5, uh, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. We see this picture of one trying to, trying to cut himself and to destroy, to, to destroy the demons really working through him to destroy the image of God that he's been made in. And that's really the enemy's primary attack as he's, as he's trying to destroy people, he's trying to destroy the image bearers of God. It's an attack upon the creator himself. We see this picture of self, self-harm. And you can, I don't want to, you know, uh, speak too out of turn here, but you can often, if you know that the self-harm is becoming very um, prevalent in today's Western culture. And, and when you see some of these things that people are doing to their bodies, um, you can often be assured that there's some kind of spiritual aspect and connection to that uh, in some way, shape or form. Um, we also see that not only is he set on destructing himself or the demons are set on destructing him, but also to destroy others. Uh, we don't see in our, in our passage today, but in the same account in Matthew chapter 8, uh, it says that this man was exceedingly fierce he was so fierce that, so much so that no one could pass that way. There was an element and a hint towards perhaps violence towards others, a fierceness towards others that others were certainly fearful to come near him or to pass his way. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 10 that the thief comes to steal and to kill 
and to destroy. To steal and to kill and to destroy. And that this really is the end goal of, of Satan and demonic spirits. Their end goal is to destroy God's creation. To destroy the image bearers of God. Their end goal is, is murder and suicide. To destroy human beings. And we see as the Lord casts these demons out into these pigs... They, dis they destroy these pigs, or we'll talk about this in just a moment, but there's, a, there's more, there's a destruction, not of image bearers of God, but of, but of the creation that God has made. These animals were destroyed. And you know, whenever anyone's involved with the demonic, you see guys that are involved in the, in the occult, uh, it always ends, apart from God's grace, the, the end to that is, is destruction. It's always going to be destructive. It's always going to be damaging. It's going to cause pain and misery and eventually death. So we see destruction as a symptom here of this, this man's possession. Also, sec secondly, a love, a love of death or, or certainly a pointing towards uh, a, famili a familiarity with death. We see in verse 3 of our text, he was one who was dwelling among the tombs. He dwelt among the tombs of the dead. Verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs. You see this picture of death here. These are, this is where dead people were, were being buried. And he was familiar with this place. He was, he was living in this place. You know, the enemy, again, is, is completely obsessed with death. We see a culture, we live in this, in this culture of death today. We see this um, spiritual uh, um, uh, saturation of, of evil that we, that we live in the Western culture. We, we see people who are entertained by death in films and horror films and death in video games. And th we live in a culture that has a, has a love for death. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, But he who sins against me, says the Lord, wrongs his own soul, and those who hate me love death. We live in a world of, of individuals who, whether they say it or not, whether they believe it or not, they, they have a hatred towards God and a love towards death. You see the media pushing for euthanasia. You, we live, in, a, we live in, a, in the United Kingdom, 800 unborn babies every single working day are being put to death. These are the ones that we, that we know about that are, that are recorded. You know, we live in a culture of death. Everywhere you look, you look on, the on a film, you look in a magazine, people are mesmerized, they're fascinated by death. And it's demonic in, in essence. Thirdly, we see this kind of super, a supernatural strength that uh, this man seems to have. We see in verses 3 and 4, uh, the one who, who had his dwelling among the tombs, no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been, been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. You see this picture of one who has this kind of supernatural strength, so to speak. These demons perhaps working through this man, breaking these chains. You know, all power belongs to God. God is the God of all power. He's the God of all. He's limitless in his power. But there is a power that is, that is an, evil, um, an evil power. Yes, it's sovereignly um, ordained by God, the Lord. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, he allows the devil to, to, to do and to be who he is. Not as the author of evil, but as the, the one who sovereignly, passively ordains um, this, this whole uh, war that is taking place amongst humanity and evil. The Bible definitely says that the, de that the devil has a particular power. In 1 John ch chapter 5, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In Acts 26, um, when, when the Apostle Paul's recounting his conversion, he said that Jesus said to him, I will, deliver, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And as we read earlier, the devil himself is described as the prince of the power of the air. 
Now, there's a few things for us to think about from that. We, we must recognize that these spirits are powerful. There are things that, are, that they do have a particular power. It's no, it's no um, opposition to the power of God. Sometimes people have this idea that the devil is kind of like the boxer that's fighting in the red corner and God is the boxer that's fighting in the blue corner. That's not the picture that we see in Scripture. God is the one with, with all power over all creation. Yes, he is a devil, and yes, he has power, but he's, he's, he's God's devil. He, he was made by God. He's a creature. He has nowhere near the amount of power that God has. In fact, I once heard a, pre a preacher say that if the devil and all his demons and all the hordes of hell attacked God himself, they would have no more power than a, a little gnat trying to beat its head against a piece of granite the size of this earth itself. God is limitless in his power. But we must recognize there is a, a, a supernatural uh, power that is, that is evil in essence. We see pictures of um, miracles. Taking, so, for example, in Egypt, where the Hebrews were being delivered out of Egypt, we see counterfeit miracles taking place. We see pictures of the, uh, with the eschatology in the end times. It talks about the, the man of lawlessness. Uh, who will be revealed and will be, uh, come with lying signs and wonders. And we even see that this within some of Christendom today. There's, there's things that take place that, may, that, that would be professing to be Christian, and actually it's, it's, not, it's not a godly power that's at work. It's an evil power that, that is at work through that. So moving on, we'll, we'll look at just a few more points before we come to our, our second point. We see... This man uh, who was possessed here with a seared conscience. In Luke chapter 8, the same account, it said that he was one who, he had no clothes on. He was naked. He was one who would cry out in the wilderness. Completely, you, you get this picture of a, a complete un, completely unrestrained, a conscience that's been seared, no longer having a, a sense of shame. And you see, this is what happens when evil begins to take over in, in a person's life. We see this very um, strong possession that's taking place here. Um, but there's a, there's a searing of this man's conscience. He's lost, a, he's lost the ability to, to think logically and to think in a, in a concise way. And then finally, in this first point, we see an element of social isolation social isolation again in Luke chapter 8 verse 27 it says this man he had no home we've already talked about how his home was amongst the tombs in, in Luke chapter 8 verse 29 it talks about how he was driven by um, a demon into the wilderness He's one who lived within the tombs. He lived within the wilderness. He had no home. He was socially isolated. He'd, he'd been cast out from amongst his own community. They'd already tried to chain him, tried to bind him, tried to push him away. But also we can see that there's a sense in which he was more um, in, this, in this state of demonic possession. He was, he was more at home in isolation in this wilderness, this picture of the wilderness. The wilderness really represents this picture of barrenness, where there's wild beasts who devour and destroy. This picture of the fall, you have the Garden of Eden, which is plentiful and fruitful, and you see the fall of man, and you see the thorns and the briars, and this picture of the wilderness going out, the picture of the curse upon creation. And we see this picture of this man here who's living in this wilderness. He's isolated from his family, isolated from his community. But ultimately, more, more significantly, he's isolated and separated from, from God himself at this point in time. Verse 7. Well, let's read from verse 6. When Jesus saw uh, from afar, the man uh, ran and worshipped him and cried out with a loud voice and said, and we, we know this is a demon speaking through him at this point. What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? What have I to do with you? 
Now, for those who may remember, just a few chapters earlier, the, um, the man in chapter 1, um, who, who, uh, when Jesus cast out the, de- the demon of the man in the synagogue, the unclean spirit, he says the same thing in chapter 1, verse 24. He says, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This picture of, um, this, this phrase, what have we to do with you, is really a phrase, a, a picture of someone trying to put separation between themselves and the person that they're speaking to. What have we to do with you? You hear that sometimes in, in our own language. What, what's that got to do with me? And you see these demons here speaking through this man. What have we to do with you? Trying to create distance and sep- and, uh, between themselves and God and this man and God. So we've seen some of the symptoms here of this demonic possession. We see the tragic condition of this man and it must have been a tragic, tragic thing to see a man in such a state as this. Talking about thousands of demons that are, that are inhabiting uh, this, this individual. Causing him to cut himself and to cry out in the wilderness, to live in the tombs of the dead. A terrible condition. A lost condition, a condition of the, which really is a picture of the fall of creation. But we see the sovereign grace and authority of Christ over evil. Firstly, this was a mission that was ordained. A mission that was ordained. We see really this picture here of um, the parables that we were sharing the other day. That I was talking about. Jesus gets into the boat. He goes across the Sea of Galilee. He delivers this man from the demons. They get back into the boat and they go back again. This was ordained by Christ. This was like, this wasn't just a coincidence. In fact, there are no coincidences with God. God is the one who reigns and rules sovereignly. And it's important, the reason I read at the end of chapter 4, the wind and the waves aspect, it's important because this same sovereign God who stood upon that boat and commanded the wind and the waves to be still. And the whole of nature obeyed his voice. The physical realm, the physical realm of nature. This same, uh, this same God, Jesus Christ, is now gone over the sea and he commands the spiritual realm, showing that he is the king not only just of the natural, but he's the king of the supernatural. That the demons have to obey his voice and his commands. It's ordained by God. We see in verse 2 that this man immediately comes out of the tombs. He saw him and he ran, verse 6, he ran and he worshipped him. Now there's a sense in which this could have been the man's own desire. Here he is in turmoil, he knows he's got no other hope and he comes out and he, and he, and he comes and worships Jesus. This could be his own desire to be delivered. Or it may indicate some kind of involuntary submission uh, of the demons within this man to the greater power of Christ, their creator. But either way, the demoniac man or man or men came and worshipped Christ, we see in verse 6. Isn't it, isn't it a, a wonderful reality that God is in control? It's a wonderful reality that Christ is on the throne that he has sovereignly ordained all things, that the Bible tells us he's working all things according to the counsel of his will, to such a degree that he gets into a boat, he goes across the the Sea of Galilee, he delivers this man of, of these demons, he gets back in the boat and goes back, presumably with his disciples. What a wonderful picture we see here, that God is on the throne, that Jesus Christ is reigning and ruling today. So, Christ has has ordained this mission. He's met with the man and the man has has has, has shown uh, worship towards him. And then he begins to have this encounter with the demon or the demons, with legion. Christ begins to deal with this man's greatest problem at this time. His spiritual bondage that he's in. From verse 7 onwards we begin to see this encounter Uh, begin to ensue between Christ and the demons. Now sometimes there's a a demon in the singular that is speaking. We see in verse 7 
And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you? You see this kind of singularity, verse 9. Then he asked him, oh sorry, that, no, that, uh, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he answered. So you see this singularity of this demon conversing with Christ. Maybe, maybe it was a, almost like a spokes, one of the, the spokes demons, if I could put it like that, that was speaking on behalf of this legion. But then you see in verse 9, the plurality of these demons within this individual. Verse 9, uh, Jesus asked him, what is your name? Then, then he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So you see that? You see the switch often between the singularity and the plurality of these demons within this man. My name is Legion, for we are many. Now the idea of legion, now the legion was one of the largest uh, Roman um, soldier units that existed in the day. There was often uh, up to 6,000 soldiers would, be, would make up a legion uh, within the, uh, the Roman army. Now that doesn't necessarily mean say there were 6,000 demons within this uh, individual. Uh, uh, more, than, more than probably over 2,000 if there was 2,000 pigs and they went into these pigs. But it just, show, it just goes to show the level of bondage that this man was in, the level of spiritual uh, bondage that he was under. And it's interesting, I mean, when you think about these demonic spirits, how, you know, to think that t over 2,000 or 2,000 or more spirits can inhabit a person and possess a person. You see, a spirit doesn't operate in, a, in this kind of, um, in a metaphysical, in a, in a in, sorry, in a physical dimension. Uh, they're, they're outside of the realms of uh, physics and they were in, ultimately inhabiting the, the soul of this man. They were possessing this individual. So we see these uh, many uh, demons that were in him. And it's interesting that during this encounter Christ's authority was assumed. Christ's authority was assumed. Verse 7, they say, in a loud voice, they said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? They knew who he was. They, they proclaimed the truth, which is very, I always find that fascinating to think that here are demons, they're actually proclaiming things which are true. They're saying Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. Now that's the hardest form of deception to spot. You know, there's a lot of people who speak a lot of truth but actually it's motivated in evil, it's, it's motivated in wrong. The enemy uses the word of God to twist and to distort and to, dis and to destruct. But they knew that Jesus was the son of the most high God. The Bible says even the demons believe and they tremble. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But look at Christ's response. They knew him, they knew who he was. Jesus Son of the Most High God, verse 7. And then verse 9. Then he asked him, what is your name? What is your name? So you see this picture of authority there. You know, if you went down to London today, and you went to Queen Elizabeth II, and you said, hi, it's Queen Elizabeth. She's, we're going to know who she is, because we recognise who she is. But then she'll say, what's your name? She won't, she won't know us. She'll ask us our name if, if, well, if that conversation took place. But she would ask us our name. And, it, and, it, and it, it assumes a level of authority. Now Jesus said, what is your name? They knew him. And, then, and in a sense, without going, maybe we go one layer deeper, Jesus, in a sense, knows all things and, and doesn't know all things at the same time. There are times in his ministry where he reads the hearts of people and he shows his, his omniscience in his divine nature. But here he asks this, uh, specifically this demon, what is your name? Presuming his authority. And then he begins to demonstrate his authority. Verse 10, we see a legion. They begin to beg Christ earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. And then verse 12, so all the demons begged him. We see this kind of begging process going on, saying, saying to him, send us 
uh, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And then verse 13, Jesus gave them permission. Jesus permitted it to be so, demonstrating his authority over the whole situation. These demons knew that their judgment was near. They said in verse 7, the second half of verse 7, I implore you. This is interesting actually as well. They say, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. They're appealing to God. They're imploring Christ by God that that he does not torment them. Now that's fascinating to to see that within within the text there. But ultimately, they know that their judgment is coming. In, the, in Luke's account, in chapter 8, the demons, it says that the demons begged Jesus that he, would not, that he would not command them to go down into the abyss. That he, that he would not command them to go down into the abyss. So they knew judgment was near. They knew that their time and their days were numbered. And this brings us now to perhaps one of the really one of the most unusual sections within the Gospels, really. Um, this, this incident with the pigs, it's very unusual, it's very um, profound. It would have been, a, it would have been an amazing uh, thing to, to see and to be, to be a witness to. We see this picture of these pigs, around about 2,000 pigs that were feeding uh, near the mountains. It says in verse 11, there was a, now there was a large herd of swine feeding near the mountains. In, in, in Matthew's account, Matthew 8, it says that the pigs were a good way off. So they were, they were a fair distance. They weren't kind of like right on the cliff edge by this point, potentially. Now in the Old Testament, it's in, this is very important as well, pigs are considered to be unclean animals. In Mosaic law, in Leviticus 11, di- the dietary requirements for the people of God were to see pigs as unclean animals and we'll talk more about that in just a moment but in verses 12 and 13 in fact let's just read it shall we so all the demons begged Jesus saying send us to the swine that we may enter them verse 13 and at once Jesus gave them permission then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine there were about 2,000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. 2,000 pigs. How many pigs do you think you'd fit in this hall today? 50? 60? Maybe 80? I was thinking as I arrived this morning, this car park, maybe 500. You times that by four. Think about how many pigs must have gone down off this cliff, off this steep place as it says running down this steep place verse 13 over the edge and into the sea now there's different views as to why this took place there are different views the commentators aren't all agreed <clears throat> and i wouldn't want to i hope this doesn't raise i hope this doesn't raise more questions than give answers today really but i just want to look at potentially three different um, perspectives as to why this took place well firstly we see potentially a frenzied destruction, a frenzied destruction. Um, we see the, uh, the picture of this man who was cutting himself and destroying his own body and now these demons have entered these pigs and it's almost as though potentially there could have been just a complete frenzied panic and these demons have gone, uh, sorry these pigs have gone and they've just gone to their deaths off the edge of the cliff. That's, that's one potential and again I hope this doesn't raise more questions than and give answers uh, this morning but maybe secondly it was more of an in, uh, more of an intentional decision more of an intentional destruction maybe the demons were actively intentional for whatever reason to send these pigs off the side of this cliff they, they did they did um, in verse 12 they asked Christ to be sent into these pigs They said, send us into these swine, in verse 12. They can't affect the image bearer of God. They can't destroy this man's life anymore. So can can we be intentionally sent into these pigs and we'll destroy the creation of God, God's creation? 
something more intentional about this. For some reason, maybe they intentionally wanted to go into the water. They wanted to inhabit these animals in order to die in the sea. It's interesting, you know pigs are really good swimmers. If you, if you have a pig in, a, in a, a reservoir or lake, they'll swim across that lake. The Bible says that they all died, they all went to their death. There was something intentional about the death of these pigs. And then the third potential could be a picture of judgment. Well, we do see a picture of judgment here, a picture of judgment and deliverance. There are some who say, well, Jesus would, would never have ordained the death of 2,000 pigs. He would never be so cruel as to kill these animals. But I think, well, we know from Scripture that God is in control, that God is working all things according to his will. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus was in full control. And I believe, I, I personally lean more towards this, this perspective that Jesus was in full control of this situation. And these demons were sent by his permission over the edge, over the edge and into the abyss, so to speak. It, it shows us the greater concern that Jesus has for mankind than he has for animals. Now, it's, it's good as human beings for us to care for animals. We're called to take dominion over the creation, in, in a sense, and to care for, for um, the animals that the Lord has given uh, to, to us to care for. But, you know, Jesus didn't come to, to die on a cross for pigs. He didn't come to die on a cross for animals. He came to die on a cross for human beings. He didn't come to die on a cross for demons. He came to die for human beings. We're the crowning uh, glory of his creation. We see this picture of judgment here. <clears throat> we see this picture of judgment being administered upon these demons as they're cast out into these, un into these unclean animals and they run down and go off this steep place into the sea. You know, water sometimes, I don't want to make too big a leap here, but water sometimes in scripture is, is defined and connected to judgment. It's connected to the judgment of God. Stuart um, has very kindly been uh, taking us through um, Genesis recently. We see this picture in Noah. God judged the whole of this world by flooding, bringing this worldwide flood. We see as the Hebrews are, are being delivered from Egypt, God destroys the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. You see this picture of judgment and we see this here. Uh, as we see these demons going off the edge of this cliff, inhabiting these unclean, uh, gentile animals, these, these unclean animals. So what happened to these demons? Well, the reality is we don't really, we don't really know for sure at this specific point. Obviously, we know the end uh, for, for all the, the, the demons. But at this particular point, were they, were they released to, to wonder the earth? Um, looking for others to inhabit. Um, Matthew 12, 43 says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, and this is interesting, he goes through dry places, goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Or were they presumably sent to the abyss, the very place they were begging the Lord not to send them to? Just before we come to our final, final point this morning, I just want us to consider the significance of this miracle, the location in which it took place. Jesus, the God-man, was born as a Jew. The disciples were Jewish. They went over from a Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. They went into a Gentile territory. On the, on the eastern side of, of Galilee, and the southeastern side, you have a, a region called the Decapolis, the Decapolis, which is ultimately, <coughs> it's a political association of 10 independent Greek cities. It's a Gentile uh, area. It's an area that would have been, in some ways, considered scandalous for a Jewish person to, to go to in some sense. That's why you, you see them herding these 2,000 pigs. This is, a, this is a Gentile area. Jews would never have um, herded pigs like that. Jews would, Jews would never have owned pigs like that. So here's this Jewish these Jewish men with the Saviour entering into this uh, area, uh, Gadara, uh, which is in the 
uh, which is uh, the city in the country of the Gar Gardarines. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, in the eastern side, the southeastern side of Galilee. Now, we're not exactly sure exactly where this took place, but the, if, you, if you go on Google or you look on YouTube and stuff, there are cliff tops around that area that are very likely to be the area where these pigs went over the edge and into the sea. But it's very significant that this is a Gentile area. Jesus, they get out of the boat, they met, they're met with it by a naked man. Now again, that would have been something that would have just been scandalous in Jewish, Jewish culture. This man is naked and considered unclean in many ways. <clears throat> they come and they speak to him. They have an encounter with uh, the demonic through this man. And the demon says, we are legion, for we are many. You see this picture of the Roman soldiers, another Gentile, a Gentile army, 6, 000, this unit of soldiers of 6,000 people. You see this very Gentile kind of feel going on here. These Roman, this kind of Roman unit, the very name of the demons that are within this man. We see here an anticipation and a foreshadowing of the gospel going forth into the Gentile world. We, we see here a picture of Christ, this king, ushering in his kingdom, bringing deliverance, not just to his own house, not just only to the house of Israel, but bring, bringing to deli deliverance, bringing his deliverance to the nations of all mankind, to the Gentile nations. Christ, the light of God, coming down and shining in the darkness and the darkness fleeing the darkness knowing its end is near here's Jesus Christ the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords we see this picture here of him binding the strong man we see this picture here of him delivering this man who's maybe faced years and years of oppression this Gentile man He's been ostracized from his community. He lives amongst the dead. He's destroying his own body. And Jesus comes and sets the captive free. Jesus comes and delivers this man from evil. And we see this picture of judgment, this uncleanness that is going to be washed away. And you know, there is a judgment day coming where all sin is going to be dealt with. All evil is going to be judged and washed away. And it was dealt with, the, the sin that needs to be dealt with within us as Christians was dealt with upon Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ dying on that cross, becoming sin. Not that he was defiled in his being, not that, not that, he, was def not that he, he, he didn't become a sinner on that cross, but he, he became a sin bearer. And the judgment that should fall upon us as sinners, fell upon Christ. We see this wonderful picture here of the deliverer, the one who can come, the one who does come and set the captives free. We see this picture here of the gospel going out into the Gentile world, that the, that the salvation of God was more than just for uh, the people of Israel, but it would be for all those from, from sea to sea who would come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm conscious of time here, but if I could just maybe very quickly go through my final point. We see a changed life, a changed life which testifies to the transforming power of God. Oh, what a wonderful reality. Everyone in here today who's been born again will know the reality of the joy that the new birth brings, the joy that is found in the Lord, the joy of the Lord which is our strength, that joy that is found, that, that, that peace that is found as we come to the Prince of Peace, that soundness of mind that can only be found in Christ. We see in verse 15 of our text, then they came back <clears throat> after, it had been, after they had gone and reported what had happened to the people in the cities and the surrounding areas, they came back to see Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had had the, had, had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind 
sitting and clothed in his right mind. You know, in, in, um, in Luke's account, in, Luke, in the book of Luke, it says that he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful picture. Here's this one who's just been in so much turmoil, so much bondage all his life, and here he is now sitting at the feet of Jesus. Do you know, friends, there's no greater place to be than at the feet of Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no more wonderful place to have your mind uh, filled with peace than when you're sitting at the, the feet of the Prince of Peace. This man's mind was no longer in turmoil. He'd experienced the love and the power of Christ and he knew that that's where he wanted to be. He no longer wanted to be in the tombs. He no longer wanted to be out in the wilderness crying and cutting himself. He wanted to be at the feet of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's important, because he trusts in you. This man trusted in Christ. This man trusted that this, this Christ is, is the, the God of all power. His life was in tatters, his life was in ruin, but he trusted in Christ and his mind was kept in perfect peace. We know the, the well-known text in 2 Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, when you have an encounter, when a person has an encounter with Christ, there's a peace that he gives that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't mean to say you're going to be taken out of every trial, you're going to be delivered from every uh, obstacle coming our way, but as Christians, we can know that he is in control that he is the one who has the power over the natural world and the supernatural world. Jesus Christ, the King. Secondly, well, just, just to finish in just a moment, this man's shame was now removed. His shame was now removed. We see in verse 15, um, <clears throat> he was sitting and clothed and in his right mind. He was clothed. Up to this point, he was naked, he was running around naked with no shame. His conscience had been seared. He had no, uh, no sense of conviction over his condition. But now here, he, now here he is, he's clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. No chains could hold him. No guards could keep him down. But there was only God's power that could, that could transform this man. Only God's power that could set him free from his shackles and tame, and tame him. Only Christ. We see this picture here of being clothed. You know, the Bible says this idea of being clothed is in reference to salvation, to be covered. Isaiah 61. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. The robe of righteousness. This, this man was clothed and it wasn't his own doing. And we need to be clothed in Christ's righteousness and that cannot be given by our own do that, that isn't a, um, attained by our own doing. It's only a gift from God. It's own, uh, the righteousness that God gives is what we need to clothe us and to remove our shame from us. And then finally now, this life that is transformed gives a testimony to Christ. Oh, what a wonderful reaction. We see this man who's transformed and changed and he wants to go, he wants to go with Jesus. Um, we see here in um, verse 18, they get into the boat and he who had been demon-possessed begged them that he might go with him. He wanted to go with him. He, he was sold out. You ever heard that expression, sold out for Jesus? This man was sold out for Jesus. He wanted to go with him. But Jesus said, he didn't permit it, again showing his authority, but he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. He gave him the commission. He, you know, this was like the first Gentile missionary. Jesus commissioned this man, go home, go to the Decapolis, go to these... Go to this Gentile nation, these cities that don't know me, 
and go and tell them what great things that Lord Jesus has done for you. And it says that he went back in verse 20, he he departed, he began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done, and it says, and all marveled, all marveled. And if you go to chapter 7, just quickly, just as we close now, they're back over in the Decapolis later on. They're back over in the Decapolis and Jesus heals a deaf and a mute um, uh, person in uh, verses 31 down through to the end of the chapter in in chapter 7. And, um, And in verse 37, this was the people's response. And they were astonished beyond measure saying, He, that's Jesus, has done all things well. He makes both the deaf and, the, and uh, to hear and the mute to speak. So we, the reason why that's important is because we see another reaction from the people here in our text today. We see the reaction of the man who's delivered. He wants to go with Jesus. He's sold out for Jesus. But Jesus says, go home, tell your family. And he, and he obeys. He obeys Jesus' voice. Now that's interesting because... Sometimes there's things that we want to do for Jesus and we think this is what Jesus wants me to do and actually Jesus wants us to do something else. But we need to be obedient to whatever he calls us to do. Sometimes what we think is the best way isn't always the best way. Jesus sent this man back to the Decapolis. He began to proclaim and we see later on in the, in the scriptures that there was a more of a sensitivity towards the things of Christ. There was something going on amongst that area perhaps due to this man's profession, perhaps due to his proclamation. Because there were another group of people. There were another group of people, just as we finish. There was another group, and that's the group who came from the local area at this time. And they saw what had happened. It says in verse 16, those who saw it told them how it happened to him and how he had been demon-possessed, and about the swine, about the pigs. And then, and then in verse 17, then they began to plead with Christ to depart from their region. You see, these people, they experienced something of the power of God. They experienced something of the fear of God, something of this, this powerful miracle. But yet their hearts were set. They were, in one sense, they were disappointed. They, they just lost 2,000 pigs, that would have been a whole livelihood for a whole community. These pigs have gone off the edge of the cliff and they say to the Lord of glory, depart from us. Depart from us. So we see the difference here. A transformed life. You know, you can't, you can't argue with a transformed life. I'm going to finish now. There's no argument with a, when a person comes into contact with Christ and they're changed. We spoke earlier, we've been praying about family and friends. Do you know one of the greatest ways to witness to your family? There there are times for us to speak, it's important. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. That's that's the truth of 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 the reality of the scripture.